Welcome to our fourth interview in this series. Thank you all for listening. My name is Hannah Harris, and I am the program coordinator with the Sun Valley Institute for Resilience. Our mission is, as an organization, is to invest, educate, and collaborate to ensure the economy, environment, and people in the Wood River Valley and beyond can thrive. We have been focusing in recent years on transforming our regional food system, regenerative agriculture, and climate smart land management. Um, as I mentioned, this is our fourth interview in our 2024 series, and today we have an incredible guest with us, Daisy Fair. Daisy is the owner of Dig In Consulting, which supports farms and farm owners um, navigate the complexities of farming and business. Her practices are deeply rooted in eco-agriculture, and she was a boots-on-the-ground farmer for 15 years before switching to consulting um, in order to make a broader impact. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thanks, Hannah. Glad yeah. to be here. Thanks, Daisy. So before we get to our questions, would you please tell us a little bit more about yourself and how you became inspired to be a farmer and then also expand your knowledge and eventually move into consulting. Let's see, I guess uh, I grew up in northern New Mexico where my mom had an organic apple orchard. She actually received the first organic certification for the state of New Mexico. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah, it's pretty cool. She still has that. So I grew up doing the spring and fall hustle with apple orchards. And then in college, I was really focused on botany, wanted to be a botanist. Until I took an environmental science class um, with Fred Montag at the University of Utah, and I realized that agriculture and farming was the most impactful way that I could help save our planet. Mm -hmm. um, so I started working on a farm, and as you know, learning the ropes of farming, and then, <laughs> then I decided that farming was just a stupid hard way to make a living. So then I decided that kids, getting kids educated and into growing food just on the home garden scale or, you know, whatever was, was really important. So I ended up working with a school in Park City, Utah, starting a school garden program, which was great. And I was offered the, you know, job of my dreams that I couldn't say no to and ended up starting a farm in Park City that I ran for 14 years, Copper Moose Farm, still there, going strong. And what I experienced in farming, as any farmers out there know, you get really focused on the day-to-day -day survival or the season-to-season mm -hmm. -season survival because it's so intense running a market garden. Yeah. Um, and although we always practiced, um, you know, the, the best eco-agricultural practices, it was part of the focus but not the entire focus. Mm -hmm. And there was always a lot of things that I wanted to do better and spend more time on, but you can't when you have, you know, 48 different vegetable crops yeah. and cut flowers and all that stuff. So uh, I had some changes in my personal life and I had to step back from running that farm and ended up in consulting because I've, you know, I've had a lot of experience on the ground and there's a lot of people out there who want to start farms who maybe don't have the land-based knowledge. Mm, so, yes. um, yeah, so that's what I've been doing for, I don't know, four or five years now and, and expanding my, my knowledge and my interest with the microbiome in the soil as well, because, um, again, people who are farmers probably know that that's really where it all starts and stops is mm -hmm. what's going on in your soil. So the healthier your soil is, the less work there is as a farmer. Um, yeah. No, that's a lie because you'll find something else that you needed to do instead. But <laughs> So yeah, that's how I've ended up in consulting. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you. I love too that you mentioned soil as kind of the foundation that came up in our last interview too as resiliency and regenerative practices being so integrated with each other but how soil is kind of the keystone of, of it all. Yeah, it. I mean, it literally, it's where the roots are. Yeah. You know, that's that's our base. Yes. So it's it's got to be healthy in order to have the healthiest and most productive foods that we can. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so our next question is, could you please tell us a little bit more about Dig In Consulting and a few topics you are especially passionate about working on when you work with clients and land? So I think generally I work with smaller scale farms 
and improving efficiencies, whether it be a large scale farm or a small, or small scale farm are just incredibly important. And it's something that I really like to nerd out on. Every step you take should be a productive step, right? Mm. Wasted steps is wasted time in your day, it's wasted money. So setting up efficient systems gets me excited. And that goes from, you know, good planning in the winter so that you have a roadmap for the summer. Granted, there are gonna be many left and right and U-turns you didn't expect, but it's, feels good as a farmer to have yeah. a roadmap coming into the season. And then workflow, just back to how many steps you take, the, the workflow and organization of your week and how you can possibly get it all done in a week when there's two weeks worth of work. So workflow is super important. And then, especially in these high altitude farms where we've got a, a four, se four seasons, mm -hmm. maximizing your year round production. Oftentimes in the summer, you know, the market is there, people want to buy, um, but you just, you can't produce anymore because you're already producing it all and you can't go into any markets. You're already going to all the markets you can fathom. But winter is often an area where the supply isn't there. The demand mm -hmm. is usually still there. Supply isn't. So I love working on, you know, indoor growing spaces that are really productive in the winter. That probably stems from the stubbornness in me when I started Copper Moose Farm in Park City, there were a lot of people who said, you, you can't do this here. We're at 7,000 feet. You can't, you can't yeah. you know, grow food. You only have like a six weeks growing season, or which is an exaggeration. It had been done in that area before, so I was not the first by any means, but um, it was great to show everyone what you can grow yes. at 7,000 feet in northern Utah. And that's possible in so many of our mountain regions, in Michigan and all of these places. So really working on winter growing systems and, uh, and how you can access your consumers in the winter. Yeah. Uh, gets me excited as well. And then obviously soil health. Yes. Which is a long journey. If you have a ton of resources that you can throw at it, the journey can be shorter, but oftentimes it's a long journey. And I think that in small scale market gardening, there is of course the no-till options, which has their positives and negatives. And there's full tillage, positive negatives. There's somewhere in the middle with responsible tillage, but anytime you include tillage into market gardening, which a lot of people do because they're a smaller operation mm -hmm. and you can't do all the handwork all the time, it's hard to support um, certain aspects of your microbiology to keep them really healthy okay. in a system where the soil is being disturbed. Yeah. And I find that a really interesting challenge, I think, um, in the you know soil food web world it's a challenge that we must meet and figure out solutions to because there's a lot of people who are farming really well they need to use a little tillage and we need to find out the best ways to support the broad spectrum of microbiology in the soil while still using tillage so it's kind of still an area that all of the questions haven't been answered yet. Okay. So I always like that as well. Yeah. I think that's about it. Oh, the, the other thing that I love to incorporate into digging consulting is working with school districts and schools. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. I've done a, a couple school garden projects, one before I became a consultant. And I think that school gardens are just such a great way to get the community involved, get kids involved, get people excited. Mm -hmm. And I think that once we as consumers are trained up to know what actually, what nutrient dense food actually tastes like. Yes. We're going to be drawn to those nutrient dense foods. We're going to want them instead of, you know, fruits that were harvested well before they were ripe and then yes. they ripen in the truck and then you eat them from the grocery store and you're like, yeah, it's an apple or yeah, it's a tomato. But when you actually taste those fruits and they've been ripened like they were supposed to, which is on yes. the vine or on the tree, you realize the difference in the flavor. So you're going to go mm -hmm. search out your farmer's market. You're going to plant your own garden or, you know, grow your own fruit trees. And to me, those little steps of each, you know, individual homeowners mm -hmm. or schools um, having gardens as part of their daily life, it helps change um, our, our kind of cultural global perspective about yeah. food, what it should taste like, and potentially, I know this is a tricky one, but what it is worth. Yes. We are very used to food not costing much and food is expensive to produce a mm -hmm. lot of labor involved and in this day and age the land that's involved is also very expensive so re-educating all of us as consumers as to what it actually takes to grow food and if you're growing your own garden you have an idea of what it takes to grow your own food which i hope that encourages people to support folks in their communities who are doing that hard work for their living to produce food for the community yeah that's a really 
Good point. And I love the, I love the discussion around what is food, what is good food worth, right? And we discuss that in our team all the time at SBIR, the point around local food not being artificially high you know, food that's grown using regenerative or organic practices that is from your community. It's not that those prices are artificially high. It's that so much of our food is priced artificially much lower because of government subsidies or because of all of these, you know, insurance practices or whatever it may be. So the food that we're used to buying at the bigger grocery stores or, you know, wherever we we buy our food that isn't the farmer's market Um, those prices are not what they should be. I couldn't agree more. Yeah. And there's, you know, obviously a broader set of rule makers involved in all of that. But yeah, the the government subsidies that small farmers generally, you know, don't apply for or, you know, wouldn't receive, it's not setting a fair playing field. Right. Of course, that has to be balanced with making food accessible to everyone. Yes working towards finding a way to solve for these different problems yes. um, is something that, that I'm interested in doing and try to do as yeah. much as I can. Yeah. But I do know that there are, there are some grants coming out now. Yes. And, and there have been for years mm-hmm. through the federal gov- government aimed towards smaller farms. Yes. They're not as big as what the big farmers are getting. Yeah. Subsidies, but it's a step. Yes. Um, and I think that if small farmers out there have the time and the bandwidth to try to find access mm-hmm. to some of the you know, state or federal money that's available to them, um, th- then these small farmers can take an active role in trying to level the playing field a little bit. Yeah. Hopefully. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Our next question is, what are some of the most important ways, and you spoke to this a little bit, but what are some of the most important ways that landowners can support healthy, resilient soil in our gardens or on our farms? I mean, well, step one is no toxic, persistent chemicals. Yes. So, you know, not using anything that is life-killing. So none of the asides, no herbicides, no pesticides. Mm -hmm. Um, That's kind of like the easy way to look at it. There's, you can get a lot deeper as you can with any of these things. There are some fertilizers or formats that are better for soil microbiology than others, but... Mm -hmm. The simple answer is use life-affirming practices, not Mm -hmm. life-killing practices. And I know how hard that can be. Yeah. Um, You know, having been a farmer for so long and and fought, you know, different issues on the farm, whether it be rodents or, you know, a fungal problem, Mm -hmm. there were times in my career where I would think, oh my gosh, I wish there was just something I could do once that would just take care of all this. (laughs) And then I would go, oh. There is, Glad and I'm say. not using those. <laughs> yeah. That's right. Those are on the table, and I get why people use them, but we're, we just can't keep killing our planet on a, on a small scale, or right. actually quite large scale. This is how we're helping to kill our planet. Mm-hmm. So again, it ties back into adjusting our perspective about what food should cost, yes. adjusting our perspective about what our lawns are supposed to look like. Or what our food actually, you know, is supposed to look like. Mm -hmm. You know, a hail-damaged apple. Well, obviously you can't spray anything to prevent that. But, you know, or a slightly insect-damaged apple. Yeah. What else? I mean, it's not a problem for me. Right. We are used to these perfect food items, which is really... It happens for sure. They're uh, produced tons of perfect broccoli heads and all of these things, but there is so much other great food that has a few blemishes or damages, and that's okay. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, as far as yards go, dandelions is, is one of my big things. I don't mind dandelions at all. Yeah. <laughs> no, yeah. I mean, they're blooming in the spring. That's when the bees don't have a lot of other flowers to feed from. I'm like, great, go for it. Yeah. Um, but as long as you we can get in the weeds here, but as long as your soil is balanced on the microbial level Mm -hmm. to encourage what, not only to encourage, but to support what you're trying to grow, Mm -hmm. then sure, you may have some dandelions, but predominantly your grass is going to succeed. So I think just life-affirming practices is number one. Increasing organic matter is okay. really important, depending mm-hmm. on where you live. Usually the Intermountain West, where we are today, organic matter is something that always needs to be increased. 
So that, I mean, there's a number of ways to do that. You can do it with compost, you can do it with mulching. Um, you know, you mow your lawn, you leave your grass clippings on the lawn. Okay, um, yeah. You know, things mm-hmm. like that. Um, or you collect those grass clippings and then go mulch your peas or something. Yes. Um, so increasing organic matter is incredibly valuable and great for the microbes and nutrient recycling, all of that. And then as I, as I already touched on, learning more about the soil microbiology. Mm-hmm. It's so cool. Yes. <laughs> it's so cool. And just mm, trying to incorporate that into your daily thoughts about you know what you're going to do, what action am I going to take to you know, take care of my vegetable garden or my perennial garden or my lawn. What can I do to not do the least amount of damage to the soil microbiology as possible? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Great. But yeah. I'd say, yeah, no chemicals. That's kind of the easiest one to just start with. Just like commit to not doing it anymore. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that there's a lot of, I mean, we've known this for a long time, but I think that the health, the human health concerns when using those, um, those aside, the herbicides, insecticides, all of it is a good incentive for people to also stay away from that stuff, especially if you have, you know, dogs or kids running around in your lawn or in your garden. Yeah, hundred yeah. percent. And then you know, talking about human health and our gut biome. Yes. Right. I mean, we are getting a lot of that from the foods that we eat, mm-hmm. and having a healthy soil biome yeah. is going to increase the health of your gut biome. Um, so yeah, do it for completely selfish reasons, <laughs> whether yeah. it be the health of your pet or the health of yourself or yeah. child. Yeah. I love the the life affirming. The practices I love that terminology and well yeah you know when you go yeah. to the grocery store or you know your ace hardware or whatever mm-hmm. and there's all these you know like kills this gnat and annihilates the weeds and <laughs> no 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 that that's not life affirming so yeah. that's an easy one you walk down the aisle you're like no 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 yes yeah. yeah and it I mean one of my personal pet peeves for most of my career and personally right now is something like voles okay um, oh they're real hard to get rid of, you know? Mm -hmm. And those are times where I'm like, wow, I just wish there was like this one thing I could do that would make them go away just one time. And there is, but I'm, I'm not going to use them. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm going to figure out other ways to try to deal with the voles. And it is frustrating. And I think, you know, something like voles where it's not necessarily as much of a appearance thing although they sure do dig up your Mm -hmm. lawn and all that but when when something is killing your trees or your vegetables or whatever it's it's really hard to say no to uh, a practice that would eliminate those animals yeah poison the ground right you know uh it's hard to say no but um but on the other hand it's really easy to you just take it off the table it's not an option so this is a follow-up question that i'm just coming up with now but this is something that I've been trying to tackle in various places throughout the community in my work, which is invasive plant species. Yeah. And so when we think about the soil and you know the repercussions of invasive species, are there things that we can do within the soil or what are some of these life-affirming practices that we could try to incorporate that keep invasive species out? Right. So... I think there's a distinction between weeds, and I'm putting yes. air quotes around that, yes. and invasive species, totally. right? So let me just touch on weeds for a second. Yes. So weeds are a really necessary part of the succession of soil as it improves. Okay. They play a vital role, right? Mm-hmm. They're quick growing. They throw out roots. The microbes are, you know, getting some of the exudates from the roots. They play a part in the whole transition of soil from, from dirt, mm-hmm. which has no nutrients, has no life, to soil, yeah, um, and so weeds are one thing, and that goes back to the appearance factor too, right? right? Like, mm-hmm. if you have a lot of weeds growing, it's probably an indicator of the stage that your soil is at, which would be that it was far more bacterial dominated than fungal. Okay, so you know it should be an indicator. There are some positives to them. Yes. You know, so that's something that can be addressed by adjusting your fungal to bacterial ratio. Okay. The invasive species, man, I I hear you on that one. It's real tricky. Mm -hmm. You know, hand pulling, obviously, on a small scale. And on larger scales, I I think it's a tragedy. I I honestly, I think this is one of the things that we're all still trying to solve for also Mm -hmm. because we know with a lot of those invasive species, they are changing the chemistry and the the biology in the soil to Mm -hmm. select 
for themselves. Totally. So that's that's some tricky warfare right there. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but I so I have no you know perfect yeah. answer on that one at all. Yeah. But invasives are yeah it's tragic to see what can happen. Mm-hmm. I mean in our area here cheatgrass is yeah cheatgrass and the mustard yep. is another one that you just see them moving in and taking over you know areas that used to have a decent balance Mm -hmm. of natives and they're getting overrun by the invasive species yeah and it's a bummer Mm -hmm. (laughs) yes well and that I guess brings to light the importance of education right and people having conversations so that they can identify what is invasive on their own properties and take care of it before it becomes this broader problem yeah and I think a lot of invasives have, um, or not a lot, but some have come from ornamentals that were brought in. Yes, And totally. have taken over. And I think the onus lays with the nurseries to mm-hmm. be very aware of of what they should and shouldn't have. Yeah. Uh, which hopefully most nurseries are pretty good at. But yep. um, I know in the Salt Lake region that leafy spurge is mm-hmm. a big problem there now, spreading up into the foothills like you wouldn't oh believe. Oh, my gosh. And that came from ornamentals you know because wow, yeah. we see spurges out there they're pretty hardy they spread they're great mm-hmm. until they're eating up your hillsides right yeah man that mm-hmm. is hard yeah I know locally it's they're the one that sticks out in my mind the most is the you yeah. in the winter time yeah, yeah. And the wildlife yeah and unfortunately with some of those we don't know Right. Until mm-hmm. until they're already out, you know, in yes. people's yards, and then we realize, and then it's already a problem. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, education around invasive plant species. Education around invasives. Yeah. <laughs> I think that that's something that hopefully a lot of community, mem- community members can get behind. Yes. Whether it's, you know, an issue with your own personal yard that you're trying to protect, or your favorite hiking trail, where right. you're starting to see the you know, the native wildflowers be less and less and something mm-hmm. else be more and more. And I mean, as we've all heard with trail etiquette, it's it's cleaning your shoes after you're on a trail that's yeah. invaded. It's cleaning your mm-hmm. bike tires. It's, totally. you know, looking at your dog to make sure they're not carrying seeds. It's it's pretty hard. It is hard. To reduce yeah. the spread. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, okay. Thank I you. mean, I don't know. <laughs> no, that's, no, that's all good insight. <laughs> thank you. It's a problem. What are we going to yeah. do about it? It's like, we'll tackle it somehow, <laughs> some way. Yeah. Okay, so switching a little bit away from, you know, and I know that was a an improv question around invasive species, but kind of coming back to soil, I know that locally more and more people in our Wood River Valley community have become really passionate about composting. And so more and more folks have these little in-home kind of food waste management systems or bin systems on their property. Um, we have a great industrial composting option. So with tumbler systems or bin systems, there are kind of basic guidelines around how much nitrogen rich material versus carbon rich material to add. And some people refer to this as green to brown. Moisture content and temperature can also impact compost quality. You and I have had a lot of conversations about how quality of compost is really important. So could you please speak a little bit or as much as you'd like to these inputs and how people can kind of manage these inputs to create the best compost they can. (laughs) So that's, it's tricky. Mm -hmm. Um, Compost, I mean, compost happens, right? You leave a pile of weeds out in the yard, they start composting. Compost Mm -hmm. happens on one level. Right. On another level, good compost, really good compost doesn't just happen. Mm -hmm. (laughs) you do have to get your ratios correct you do have to get your ingredients correct Mm -hmm. and it's a lot of work and I would say it's more work than most homeowners are interested in doing yeah probably including myself you Mm -hmm. know I take my kitchen waste I dump it in my tumbler keep my tumbler tumbling yes (laughs) but I think what's important is to realize what that end product is going to be for you so Mm -hmm. it is not going to be a well-balanced microbiologically speaking compost Mm -hmm. it is most likely going to be incredibly bacterial dominant which is most likely not not going to benefit your vegetable garden or your trees or your fruits Mm -hmm. what it does do is it reduces your food waste yes that you're throwing in the landfill which is you know worthwhile on its own and I think that if treated properly after the fact after it comes out of your tumbler or your bin 
it can be improved a little bit. So usually in a tumbler situation, you are tumbling it a bunch, right? right? Hopefully. If you're not, it's probably going anaerobic, which is really bad. You yeah. probably don't that, want that on your garden at all. But if you're tumbling it a bunch, so you're keeping it oxygenated, you're keeping the cooking process going on in there, well distributed you know, throughout all the ingredients. Oh, if you're tumbling it a bunch, you're not allowing for a lot of fungal growth or activity yes and that's a really important part in good compost mm -hmm. and so if you then take your tumbler and empty it um, into a pile and hopefully you do have some fungal spores in there mm -hmm. you generally just leave that pile alone and it would be outside now imagining at this point and keep the moisture content decently high 30 to 40 percent okay and just make sure it doesn't get stinky or anything like that mm -hmm. even though a lot of that should have already be processed out there's a chance that you can start to increase your you know fungal biomass in that mm -hmm. compost and start to improve it there's a chance but i will yeah. say that making really good compost you know, when looked at under a microscope to see actually what's going on in there, it's hard. Mm -hmm. um, and it's hard to source the right amount of the different ingredients that you want. Usually you're not going to produce it in your household. Right. Um, you may have enough of the, the brown material from grass clippings and, you know, wood chips or whatever you've got. But getting really good green material, it's hard to get enough of it mm -hmm. because you want the right percentages and ratios. And so then there's always the option of, you know, maybe, you know, an alfalfa farmer down the road mm -hmm. where you could be getting some of their, you know, greener materials, but then you have to be assured that they've been using life affirming practices yes. so that you're not just killing whatever was alive in your compost by the chemicals that have been brought in. Yeah. So this is another one that like, I don't, I don't have this awesome, easy answer. Mm -hmm. um, and there's lots of, you know, there's lots of YouTube information out there mm -hmm. about how to build a, a good compost pile, quote unquote. And I encourage people to experiment and see if there's recipes that they like the best. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the end product, if it smells really good and rich and earthy, like a forest floor or soil, yeah. um, there's a good chance that it, you know, that it's good enough. Yeah. And then if you're interested in knowing actually what's going on in your compost, you can find there are, you know, labs out there and lab technicians who can do a microbiology test for you and let you know exactly what's in there. Wow, um, that's so cool. So I wouldn't, I certainly wouldn't, you know, have anyone shy away from composting because I yes. think no matter what you do, you are mm -hmm. helping out the bigger picture. But if your compost ever smells bad mm -hmm. or, um, or even doesn't smell good, it's probably not going to benefit your garden or yeah. your bushes or your trees. Yeah. That is not the answer I want to give. Yes. Honestly. Yeah. Um, but it's like, important to know. It's important. What's important to about it for me is that I don't want compost to, and I'm using air quotes again, I don't want compost to get a bad name. Right. Right. So you do your tumbler process. It's brown. You know, it's kind of a dark brown. And you throw it out there and like either nothing happens or you know that plants. maybe your plants aren't <laughs> thriving as much. And yeah. then you're like, oh, compost is bunk. You know, it, yeah. it doesn't work that is giving compost a bad name yes and it's it wasn't it was that compost certainly but there are ways to produce really good compost yes that are very life enhancing that can help your soils with the balance in the microbiology select for the plants that you want to grow they're going to thrive mm -hmm. they're going to outcompete the weeds yeah um, very cool uh and so i'm curious with the bacterial to fungal ratio if there are, so kind of a follow-up to this question, are there other, is there a way to like, for example, inoculate your, is that the right word? Yep, that is the right word. Inoculate your compost? Yeah, oh yeah, there, there certainly is. And there's lots of products out there and you can even just get, you know, shiitake mushroom blocks, you know, and inoculate your compost. Now, okay. there is some, I don't want to call it con controversy, but there's a discussion going on mm -hmm. in the microbiology world about the, the native fungal species yes, yeah, versus ones that you're bringing in. So, yep. you know, the native species that we have in the soils mm -hmm. around us, they are, you know, they have evolved and they have developed with the plants that are growing here. Yes. So they're, that's a, you know, it's a good match. Usually right. they're the ones yeah. that are supposed to be interacting together. And you don't necessarily get that when you're ordering in, you know, a fungal inoculation. Yep. Having said that, on the, on the flip side, any fungi 
is fungi in the soil. And mm-hmm. as long as it's a beneficial fungi, mm-hmm. it's helping to change the composition of the soil and to you know balance the fungal to bacterial ratio. So yes, there's lots of ways to inoculate. Another way to inoculate is to go to a really healthy section of forest that you happen to know of. Forests, Mm -hmm. healthy forests, have a much higher fungal ratio to bacteria. Okay. That's that's what trees thrive on. Yeah, mycelium. Yeah, yeah. mycelium and all that. So just getting a little bit of that native soil. Okay. We don't want to see people out there with like, right, you know, (laughs) pillaging the forest of all of its soil. But that's a way to inoculate, you know, your compost pile. Right. Is to just throw in some really healthy native soil because you're going to have the, you know, the local species um, Mm -hmm. that that will probably be very beneficial. Yeah. Hopefully. Again, healthy soil. Mm -hmm. So that's something that I always do. Like when I'm starting, as the aforementioned vole issue at my house, I've had to raise all my garden beds up and out of the the ground, which I don't love. Because then you end up having to engineer the soil a little bit, right? Because you don't have a big pile of beautiful topsoil sitting around waiting for you to build a bed. And I always make sure when I'm, you know, building my beds and engineering the soil with what, you know, peat moss and compost and whatever else I may have, I always make sure that I'm putting in some of the native soil okay. in my garden. Because, you know, it's an inoculation, right? It's mm-hmm. small amounts. Yep. And then as long as the conditions are kept appropriate in that garden bed for your vegetables, it's going to be the correct conditions for the biology in there too. And then hopefully what you sprinkled in is going to populate those beds yeah. over time. Yeah. It takes longer. If you use a handful per bed, mm-hmm. it's going to take a little while to populate. But that's a great solution mm-hmm. if you are concerned about uh, you know which mushrooms to order or whatnot yeah. that you can trust in a healthy forest system. Um, probably has a broad spectrum. That is so you want. great. Yeah. And it kind of, I really like that thought because it kind of provides like a tangible way to think about parallel levels of ecosystems, right? So, like, we're trying to create this really symbiotic, healthy ecosystem in our soil. So, we're going to think about how the soil interacts with things that are going in our garden and our garden ecosystem. And then, in order to get some of those materials, we're going to look to the broader ecosystem, which is our forests that surround us in our valley. Yeah. And so that's really, I just love that parallel. And I think that there are quite a few people who, I mean, we have amazing access to public lands. Again, we don't want people like digging up soil, (laughs) large amounts of soil from our uh, national forests, but there are quite a few people who, you know, they might have forest on their property. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I mean, I think you can even just look to your own property. Right. You know, say you have that choke cherry who's mm-hmm. just been the most beautiful tree for as long as you can remember, super healthy and vibrant and thriving. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Some soil from under that tree. Yeah. And I'm literally talking about a handful or two, or, you know, like a sandwich baggy size. You okay. Know, yeah. Small amounts. Yeah. Um, so you can look within your own property mm-hmm. or. Or, you know, or your friend's property who has a garden that's just mind-blowing every year. Yeah. And they're using life-affirming practices. And Mm -hmm. you talk to them and find out that they're not having to do heavy amounts of inputs every year. Yes. That that's just ask for a couple handfuls of soil Mm -hmm. and, you know, add that in. Yeah. It's like the neighborhood, like, do you guys have two eggs? We need two eggs. (laughs) Can we take some of your soil? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Great. Okay. So I'd encourage, you know, anyone who's interested, there, there are some great webinars out there. I do not work for them. This is not an endorsement, but I have found these guys mm-hmm. very interesting. The Soil Food Web. Yes. Um, and they have some great free webinars just to give you the top of the barrel information mm-hmm. on what's going on in the gardens and forests and lawns and turf and all that stuff and what role soil biology plays. It's so cool. It's yeah. so much fun. Yeah. That's awesome. a great resource. Yeah. Soil Food Web. Okay. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, And then what is, this is one of our last questions, but what is your vision for resilient agriculture or resilient land in our local community, gardens, farms in the future? So if you could, you know, go 10 to 20 years in the future and say, this is what a resilient system would look like. What does that look like? Oh, I think, I mean... 
Are we talking about my utopia or <laughs> it's possible? Actually, maybe both of them are possible. I don't yeah. Know. But I think that, you know, having a vibrant local food system is just so incredible for the community. Mm-hmm. Everything from, you know, the really fun stuff like a really vibrant farmer's market with live music and the families are there mm-hmm. and the kids are there. And, and there you have your community farmers and they're farming in a way that is life affirming for you, yes. you know, mm-hmm. for the soil, for all of that. You know, I think that's kind of the the top of the mountain there where it's, it's super dreamy. But I think that um, as we move down the line, you know, having school gardens mm-hmm. is super important. Again, just another centralizing element for the community. Mm-hmm. Kids are learning how to garden. Kids are learning, you know, how good food makes them feel. It's super important for, you know, I think their long-term physical health, mental health, all of those things. So I think vibrant school gardens is something mm-hmm. that I envision in that, in that world. And I think that home gardens, you know, yes. mm-hmm. and home gardening is not for everyone, 100%. I mean, if, you know, whether it be perennials or a vegetable garden, but obviously I'm a garden geek, but when I walk around the neighborhoods, I'm always looking at everybody's gardens and it's mm-hmm. so much fun. And we are really just one generation, maybe two generations away from most people having a home garden. Mm-hmm. And so we're not, we've lost sight of it so quickly and it would be so great to see home gardens come back. Yes. Anyone who has kids, mm-hmm. you know, there's a million reasons to do it for a kid. You know, it's fun. They love to snack on all the tasty items. It's a great family activity. Mm-hmm. It's a great time outside. It's moving your body. Yeah. It's in the sun. And it's tuning into nature no matter how small your garden is. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I think that having planters on a deck yeah. can be incredibly fulfilling. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of stuff that you can grow on a deck. And, you know, don't have a deck. I think there's a lot of things you can do in a windowsill. Totally. Um, and there's a lot of great affordable systems now that you can purchase that are kind of tiered mm-hmm. that you can set up in front of a window. And so I think getting people involved in, in growing food wherever you can is mm-hmm. is fun and, and, you know, part of my utopia. And then I think cities and municipalities and counties being more vested in that is Mm -hmm. super important. We have a lot of city spaces Mm -hmm. that could be growing food instead of grass. And I am not one of those people that says all grass should be gone. I live above a giant soccer field and that soccer field itself is a community asset where people are hanging out or walking their dogs at their soccer games. Like Mm -hmm. I think grass is great, but I think that there's a lot of it and potentially there's community spaces that can be converted to gardens, vegetable, pollinator, Mm -hmm. orchards, berries. I feel like whether it's at our homes or within our towns, we are paying already to green these spaces because we yes. all love that. And it's pretty easy to transition from a, a mountain ash mm-hmm. to an apple tree instead yeah. or an apricot tree. Or, mm-hmm. And, you know, that ties back down to what we expect to see in these places. So I know that with lots of fruits, mm-hmm. there can be a mess on the ground yeah. <laughs> you know, after the season is done. But yeah. that's kind of cool. You know, yeah. we know that we've been feeding the birds, mm-hmm. um, hopefully feeding humans, feeding the soil a little mm-hmm. bit with the fruits that drop and organic matter. So to me, that mess on the ground is the sign of a, of a system, right. um, you know, or of a, a, a part of our public space playing a role in a broader system. Yeah. You know? I think it's all possible. I think we just mm-hmm. need to transition and it's all relatively easy to do. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think definitely nationally and locally we're very close to that transition I mean the county coming out with their climate plan that was just approved which is very exciting and again like this growing community interest and momentum behind community garden spaces and also private garden spaces and I think your point about changing the narrative and the storytelling so that we are expecting to see different things in our community is really important as opposed to not in my backyard thing that you encounter, like wanting to have these large grass only spaces that aren't, you know, being utilized for what we need for grass. Like soccer. I I have a rec soccer game tomorrow night. Yeah. And I'm like so glad that that field exists, you know? hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that, um, you know, in places that you visit or go to that have really successful and well-maintained food forests or community Mm -hmm. gardens, 
and you see the community out there and involved mm-hmm. in it and not necessarily necessarily in an organized way mm-hmm. just people out for an evening stroll and snacking yeah. on some cherry tomatoes or whatever it is makes you realize how cohesive these spaces can be and mm-hmm. the new opportunities that it opens up for community interaction yes. on a positive level it is possible it is yeah. happening and i think there's momentum um, within the country mm-hmm. right now to try to increase some of these spaces. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and locally too. Yes. Know, but yeah, yeah. But locally as well. Yeah, and I know we have discussed before this importance of third spaces that we're discovering, you know, preventing loneliness and creating resources for people. And we're in a great example right now of a third space, which is a public library. But I think increasing the amount of outdoor third spaces for people and you know food production third spaces is that whole concept is so we we should be chasing that yeah because it's fantastic. well we are you yeah are. we are <laughs> we are, <laughs> we are chasing, um, yeah. and then our last question is and i always end interviews with this question if you could encourage idahoans or folks locally to participate in one climate action or way to strengthen our regional food system or way to support regenerative land practices, um, what would you encourage people to do if it was just, I know it's really hard to pick one thing. (laughs) Well, I'm not going to, I'm going to say, I'm going to say, follow your passion. Yeah. Because whatever you're passionate about is what mm-hmm. you're going to follow through on. Okay. And maybe even get more involved in. Mm-hmm. Because I feel like there's so many ways to make a positive mm-hmm. change in the direction of our, you know, our planet as a whole. That whatever your passion is, is the one that you should be doing. We're all such individual humans, which mm-hmm. is sometimes tricky, but lots of times so beautiful. Mm-hmm. Follow your own passion and what you want to try to yeah. protect or enhance. Mm-hmm. And um, that's the best thing you can do. Yeah. Great. <laughs> I hope we've sparked some some climate regenerative land management passion for folks out there who will listen. Yeah. <laughs> and is there anything that we missed or that you'd want to revisit from our discussion? I don't know. I mean, there's so much we went into that we could go into deeper, but yeah. Um, but Another get out day. to your local farmers market. You yeah. Know? That's that's one of those third mm-hmm. spaces. So. Yes. Would encourage people to do that. Mm-hmm. It kind of touches on a bunch of the things that we've talked about today. Yes. Yeah. And get to know your farmers. Yeah. I was just going to say, know your farmer. Know your farmer. Yeah. yeah. Ask them about their practices. Mm-hmm. And farmers generally, hopefully they want to talk about it. Yes. Right? Because mm-hmm. it's important. And I believe as farmers or ex-farmers like myself, that educating the public is mm-hmm. um, of, of vital importance. So. Well, thank you so much, Daisy, again for your time. Thanks, Hannah. We for learned a lot. Me. After our interview, Daisy was kind enough to send me some additional information about composting at home. Make sure to check out those details in the comments below. And thanks again for listening.